admire a lot uh, the Tao, especially because of the excellence of everything that they do. The community, just the way we are inside of the company, just feels you, just drags you in and makes you feel like part of it right from the beginning. It's amazing because uh, since the first moment I felt very welcomed by my team. Uh, everything was ready and waiting for me since the first moment. And I think the most important thing was the purpose of the company, connecting people and improving lives. We are a really young team, we are dynamic, we're small, which then makes it really easy for me to um, contribute, we work all together. I did not feel like the intern, you know, like the person that uh, is there just to support or to do the boring stuff. Uh, no, I was involved in very important things since the beginning. I was involved in presentations to the uh, executive board. You are checking some targets, you are growing, you are, you know, like it's business as we used to run in ISA, I would say. When you join a company at a really young age, it's super important that you try as many different things as you can. You learn as much as you can from the company because the more perspectives you have, the more value you can bring to the company. DPD DHL is a place for them to have a next step in their professional career. At the same time that you have a lot of values that fit into what we have in Isaac. It will take a time to transition between the amazing experience that you have in Isaac and the real world is a bit different. But if you're humble and you give yourself the opportunity to learn, to experience, you're going to grow faster. Well, get excited to upgrade yourselves. I upgraded my communication and networking skills. That analysis skills. Adaptability skills. Solution orientation skills. Communication skills. You can be what you want to be at DPDHL Group. Just apply and join our team. Hello everyone, welcome back to the election process for PAI 2022. And today uh, in this part of the election process, we will have our amazing panel um, and we will have an hour and 15 minutes to go through this panel, answer some questions and hear the candidates' opinions on topics that are going on in the world. Um, so for today, I will just be quickly giving some reminders about why we have this panel and what is gonna happen in this discussion as well as introducing our host. But to start, I wanted to um, refer why this panel is here in this election process. The panel is designed to give you an understanding of how our candidates view certain topics in the world and how do they connect those topics to ISEC. Um, we will have questions that will be asked and then we will have each one of the candidates answer. The candidates will answer the questions by order, um, the same order that they started in the opening speeches. And then once that's the order for the first question and then the second question, we will have the second person start first. So our order is Navodia, we have Luis, we have Leonard, then we have Virnia, then we have Abhishek, and then we have Caroline. And in the second question, Luis will start. And in the third question, we will have Leonard that will start. So that's the order of our questions. Um, the candidate, the first candidate always has 30 seconds to think before starting. And then we, they have approximately a maximum of two minutes to answer. Um, this is a conversation. So we are not here to time the candidates and we are not gonna interrupt, but just have in mind that um, this is how the flow goes. And also, um, after we have done our questions from the panel that we have prepared previously, MCPs, you have the chance to submit your own questions, questions from you. Um, I already sent you an email yesterday, so you can check in that email. There is a code and a link for a Slido. In that Slido, you can submit your questions and you can also upvote the questions that you see other people uh, submitting. So if you like a question, vote that question up and we will ask the question after our questions are asked. Um, so that's what we have for instructions. And now I would gladly like to introduce Silke Hein, our Upgrade Partnership Manager, and also the host of this panel. Back to you, Silke. Thank you very much, Norina. And hello and welcome everyone to this um, really, truly amazing opportunity to get to know your PAI candidates even better. 
And uh, I know it's always a, a very exciting moment and it's always a pleasure for me to host this kind of panel. For me, it's now, I think, the fourth time I'm doing this. But of course, the first time I'm doing it virtually. And also for me, it feels a little bit strange to just, you know, see you guys on screen and not really sit with you on a stage and really have the time to, you know, also chat a little bit. But um, we will make the best out of this situation as you do. And I'm very excited um, to be here with you. And um, I've seen all of your speeches, uh, very interesting, very diverse. So I think it will be a really amazing round. And it's also the first time I think we have so many candidates, at least for me, I've never had six <laughs> applicants with me. So it will be super interesting to hear so many different um, perspectives to the questions. Yes, as Lorena said, regarding the process, you have um, 30 seconds to think about the question. There's actually also a short um, information about every, every question, and um, then you will have approximately two to three minutes to answer the question. And since we don't put any kind of timer next to the question, after kind of two minutes, I think I would just do this kind of it's a usually you should see it, maybe you see it now um, to give you a short sign that you reach the end so that it gives you some time to come to the end to the question so that to be fair that everyone has the same opportunity to answer. And if you're ready, we can start. Good. So first question. It's impossible to talk about the future without understanding also that the coronavirus has had a very much impact in our modern world. And apart from millions being affected by the disease resulting in over 219 deaths, COVID-19 has had also several social economic effects in almost all countries in the world. People have lost their jobs and businesses and schools have had to reinvent to adapt to the constant changing regulations. At the same time, it has opened opportunities also for innovation and questioning our status quo and finding new needs in our current society that can also spark business and leadership opportunities. So the first question goes, as Lorena mentioned, to Navodia. With this context, what do you think Isaac needs to consider in the 2020 year to ensure that it can be at the site of opportunity and continue to serve young people around the world? Navodia, whenever you're ready, just start. Okay. Um, thank you very much for the question. Um, so I will answer, actually, I have two points uh, to see we are, with this context, how ISAC uh, moves uh, for 2022. One thing I think uh, is pandemic, looking in terms of an opportunity, allowed us to really look at ISAC and what are the kind of leaders we are developing and also how we are developing leadership. And this allowed us to understand that ISAC needs to be more included in terms of how we approach young people. Also, with connecting to this context, we understand that there is a large growing population that is happening right now. So the COVID allowed us to think in these lines, think in the perspective of young people, the challenges, the inequalities that are faced, that are created by COVID, and to address these issues uh, and make it a priority for ISAC to address these issues. And also one other thing uh, I want to add is COVID, one of the, the, the main opportunities that I also see, COVID allowed us to look into education and healthcare the possibility of, of using technology to access this. As the population rapidly increases, there's a huge need for us to improve our education because there's a large youth population who needs education right now. And education is something that is not accessible by a lot of population. And this is an opportunity where we, as we improve in technology and all of that, and also uh, to, as I said, to support this, uh, to improve the education and support the youth of the world right now. Awesome, thank you so much. 
So then I would like to hand over now to the next candidate, Louise. Thank you for the question. Um, I think to start off, I'll answer in two parts. So I think the first part of what we need to consider is how COVID already affected ISEC in the 2020 and even in the 2021 year. And I think something that was consistent in this past, which may not be moving forward in 2022, is how we all experienced the pandemic was very similar um, in the sense of plus or minus, you know, a few weeks, et cetera. But we all pretty much faced lockdown. Um, we were all in our homes. We were all moving to remote learning and also like, you know, moving our conferences and our activities online as well. However, how I see like the vaccine distribution and how I see the trends are that people are predicting about which countries or territories will be vaccinated by what time frame, we can see in 2022, it's going to be a little bit more diverse. So you'll have like countries and territories which are already moving back to, you know, physical gatherings, who are already able to connect with another in another way. And then you also have some um, countries and some territories who are still not at that stage yet. So I think for ISEC to take into consideration is definitely the diversity that of our network and of young people in 2022. So we will need to be more considerate. We will need to be inclusive in the way that we're delivering, in the way that we are building their capacity, and also the way that we're able to form a community in a hybrid world. So I think this is something we definitely need to be taking advantage of and not just seeing it as like, um, you know, something that is a hurdle that we need to overcome, but also look at it if through the lens that we are being more accessible and we are allowing more young people to actually experience what ISAC has to offer. And I think the second thing for us to consider um, in terms of how it would, you know, influence ISAC is how the pandemic has already been shifting or emphasizing behaviors in young people in Generation Z. So already we are seeing from the trends that like, yes, they were the generation that was affected by the pandemic. Um, they are the generation that is also more used to like technology as well. Um, but also we're able to see trends that yes, they are independent. They value being independent. They value their own financial security. At the same time, that doesn't mean they want isolation. So I think one thing that was always very beautiful about ISEC was this ability to be able to bring people together. And I think like in the next term, we really need to understand like what it is that this young generation is actually after so that we're able to tailor what we can offer to them so that they can see ISEC as a place that really caters, understands them. And so they feel like they would want to be part of it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Louise. And yes, it's a very challenging environment we are currently living in and it's a challenge for all of us, I think. Perfect. Lenny, what are your thoughts about this? Yes, um, I believe uh, we, we need to take a step further back and think about how COVID impacted all of us. And to me, and I guess to most of you as well, uh, being uh, locked up and not being able to go out as a young person is one of the worst things uh, that can happen to us because, I mean, we, we love to go out, um, meet our friends, and it happened all around the world. Um, and I'm wondering now what's going to happen once one region and then the other region slowly recover young people are sitting on hot coals. They want to go out there. They want to do something again. Um, the world didn't stop. There's so much going on. Like climate change didn't get better over, over those one and a half years. Uh, social inequalities didn't get better in, in those one and a half years because there was such a strong focus on the pandemic, of course. Um, so I know so many young people all around the world just want to go out and, and do something again. Um, and I think for us in Isaac, um, it is super important that we make sure we... Um, catch those young people that we can be actually a place where they can drive impact through value-based leadership development um, and, and, and help them create an environment um, to, to thrive. And for me, there's three very important points. The first one is how do we create the right work environment for our membership post-COVID? Um, agility, something modern like how does Gen Z and uh, millennials actually want to work um, after being at home in, uh, and, and doing home office for the whole time? Um, how can we have the real impact now? Um, how can we get back to our operations and drive this um, impact through the programs we offer um, uh, in our communities? Um, and the last one is then, how can we finally be part of the conversation and actually be the voice of youth? So that now all of these young people want to go, go out and drive change. How can Isaac be this organization that kind of like funnels all in together, like region by region, country by country, and then hopefully also globally um, and, and be at the table and say, hey, this is what young people want. And, and COVID has shown how, uh, how long young people has been disadvantaged um, with the recovery. Um, so yeah, those are my, my, my three points. Awesome, thank you so much. Perfect, so then 
very interesting insights so far and very interesting thoughts from all of you. Vinya, I hope I am spelling your name correctly. Um, what do you think about this question? Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, what my partner said, it's very clear. So I just want to add one, one thing is that the current situation and the world is asking for main four uh, competences. One is digital skills. That is something that is not going to change like more companies, organizations, etc., are going to continue either hybrid or virtual uh, working. Second is innovation because we need to um, renovate uh, not only inside of ISIS, but outside like all of businesses are changing and looking for innovation and the ability to engage people now that we are scattered all over the place and also like words like freelancing etc have been have become more popular so we need abilities to engage all these people to work into one uh, direction and finally resiliency so all these four things that are required in the external world i say can develop them we first, we need to evolve them inside of our organization. And also these are the competences that we develop in young people through our programs uh, that are uh, for exchange and also membership programs. And through developing all these uh, skills, we can uh, contribute to the world, like making more competent people, uh, competent, competitive young people that can also contribute to organizations, companies and the world. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Thank you so much, Vanya. Um, Abhishek, you're the next. So, there you go. <laughs> Thank you so much for that wonderful question. Um, there is a term for this generation. In my research, I've discovered that this generation is called the sacrifice generation because they don't have the same experiences that they can um, experience with their cohort. They don't have the same kind of experiences that they previously had. And like a lot of my other uh, colleagues said right now, yes, digitization is the next big thing. Everybody is forced to come online and work on that. And that is one important thing that we need to be able to get ahead of the curve. For years, Isaac has always said that its technology was the part which was catching up with it. But here is a unique opportunity where we can actually probably even get ahead by rediscovering the purpose of like what we do on the GIS, um, understanding how we can probably build a community there. But okay, let me not talk about the GIS. Let me talk about something else. Let me talk about the fact that there's going to be a gap between the people who are going to be finishing their education in this particular period of time and they're going to start looking for jobs. These people would not have had the same kind of education other people would have had. And because of which the way that they are approaching their skills and competencies would also be drastically different. So I think the real contribution of ISEC is by able to bridge, by being able to bridge this particular gap between those who did not have the privilege to survive the pandemic in a way that other people did. I think our unique uh, power of the fact that we are everywhere as a network will allow us to share ideas with each other about how to educate each other, how to build competencies with each other, allow peer-to-peer -peer learning so that we are able to bridge the gap because in ISEC we talk about the fact that leadership can be developed anywhere, anytime for anyone. That means it's not about hybrid, it's not about virtual, we should be able to adapt and more importantly we should make sure that no one is left behind because the young people who we are serving are also served by young people who have the same problems of uh, anxiety, worry, they worry a lot right now because they are not very hopeful about the future. So I think as an organization, we need to be a beacon of hope. We should be optimistic. We should be able to show them that it's all right. Like you come back, we are here to take care of you. And I think that is how we need to shape our approach. Thank you for the question. Awesome, very, very true. So Caroline, I think you're the last one for this round. So we are very excited to hear also your thoughts about this question. Exactly. Thank you. And hello, everyone. Thank you, Zeke, for asking us this question. And not to repeat what uh, my fellow candidates have already mentioned, I would like to build up on a point that Louise brought um, about Isaac needing to become more inclusive, but also having the opportunity to become more inclusive. And I think that in the last year, the pandemic showed us that there is a need for young, responsible leaders more than ever. I don't think anybody questions that. And as Isaac, we stand for de developing these type of leaders that are needed in today's world. 
And I think that actually the pandemic was kind of the kick for Isaac for us to actually being able to become more inclusive because right now we're having an international Congress and participating in this Congress no longer depends on the passport that you hold or the financial resources that you have in order to travel to that. So I think that um, also us starting to do in virtual exchange, we can really cater um, to more young people out there that maybe didn't have the chance on participating um, in an exchange before. And I think right now also it's to, for us to showcase as Tati, as Abhishek was mentioning, to be ahead of the curve and to also innovate on how we can develop leadership beyond um, exchange and beyond being a member of Isaac. Um, so that's what I would like to see specifically being carried forward in 2022. Awesome, thank you so much to all of you. I think um, COVID-19 really has shown that um, the world needs to change, but it needs to change in different ways. And I think that's something that um, you all of you brought up quite nicely. Also, another point that you actually already um, touched was digitalization. And um, I think talking about trends, um, this is definitely another one that we also want to tackle here. So we know that digital and AI technologies are transforming the world of work and that also the COVID-19 crisis has also accelerated this transformation. To future-proof citizens' ability to work, they will require new skills, but which ones? Um, you will see a short map on your screen, and according to McKinsey research, there are 56 deltas across 13 skill groups in four categories. You see them on screen. And you have some time to also look at them in a bit more detail because I know it's quite a lot of content. Um, you see cognitive, interpersonal, self-leadership and digital elements in here. And the question is really, do you think it is important that ISEC benefits of members and program participants develop future-proof skills through our programs? And if so, why? Is there anything that ISEC needs to change to do this? And this time, the question goes first to Louise. Whenever you're ready, you can start. Thank you for the question. I'm just having a read through um, the graph that you provided and I can see already that there's a lot of like a lot of the skills that you've listed there are actually things that we already tell people in ISEC about, hey, you should join ISEC as an organization because we're a good platform for you to develop leadership, for you to gain some personal soft skills and et cetera as well. And I think that is the value proposition of ISEC. Like I think majority of our members, when they first hear about ISEC, they're a university student. Um, and through university, usually you get to gain a lot of skills, which are more about what do you read in the textbooks and how it could possibly be applied, say, if you've got like an internship. But I feel like what makes ISEC unique is its ability to actually be able to develop the soft skills or interpersonal skills, which is one of the quadrants that I see on the graph here. And I think that's something that we shouldn't take for granted or we shouldn't take too lightly especially when looking at trends about how a lot of jobs are being automated, about how by 2025, there'll be equal numbers of jobs done by humans versus machines. I think INSEC's unique value proposition in being able to develop interpersonal skills through our exchange programs or through our membership program can be something that we utilize as an opportunity to hone in and develop even further. Um, if so, like answering the second part of the question, what could ISEC do differently or what could ISEC change? I think it's about capitalizing on the strengths that ISEC already has. One thing that ISEC does really well in comparison, if you look at other organizations or other leadership development platforms or tools is that ISEC allows the young person to really believe that they can make a difference. In ISEC, you work with teams, you have a support system, you have a team leader, um, you have teammates, you have people around you that are able to provide you um, with the safe environment for you to really understand, look within yourself and be able to realize that actually, yes, like I have a starting point. Um, I have a support system of people around me and I'm given real tasks and real responsibilities that challenge me, that make me think that it's scary, that I can't do it. Um, but ISEC is safe enough that I'm willing to try, I'm willing to fail. And in that process of being able to fail, we learn. 
Um, I think one of the things that I really appreciate the most about ISEC is the fact that when you fail here is like the ultimate learning opportunity. And it's a safe enough space through all the times that I didn't, um, that the outcome of a project wasn't what I expected it to be or the times which I made a mistake. I knew that these were the best opportunities for me to actually learn. So in how ISA can take this forward is to not forget what it naturally already does so well. Um, and second, to not forget that we are the ones that can understand our participants or our members the most because we ourselves are also young people too. Thank you. Thank you very much, Louise. And yes, you're absolutely right. I think you learned the most about yourself and to develop when you fail, actually. Awesome. Thank you so much, Louise. Um, Lenny, the next is for you. Thank you. Um, yes, 100%. It is important that we de develop those uh, skills to um, yeah, make everyone future proof for um, uh, the people we engage with our, with our programs. Now, I'd like to give an example also to right away connect to what we could do better. Um, in February 2020, when uh, we went for international president's meeting to Moscow, um, PwC gave a keynote and they presented the research in which they showcase what differentiates uh, a member of Isaac and an exchange participant in the people they, they served and they tested. And the, the, the skills that, the only skills that Isaac members would be able to differentiate themselves from all the other exchange participants where are our four leadership qualities, being self-aware, being solution-oriented, being a world citizen, um, and um, uh, empowering others. Wow. Um, now, I know we just uh, refreshed the Isaac way, but it shows to me what we've managed in Isaac to come up with a, a program and identify the skills that I essentially needed. Now, the answer for me is very easy. Uh, we have around 30,000 members worldwide. Um, but before COVID, we sent around 40,000 young people also abroad. So what about those 45,000 young people? How can we get them equally uh, developed and let them thrive equally as our, our members so they are competitive in, their, um, in, the, in the work market? Um, and I think now looking ahead in the future, we have to figure out a bit, identify those skills, um, take a look at our values and see how can we maybe drive them equally and see um, to, to bring our, the participants in our pro programs equally along like, we're, like we already do with our membership. Perfect, thank you so much. Then the next in line this time is Svenja. Thank you so much. So for sure, uh, we need to develop all these skills because that's why ISEC is here in this world, you know, to provide opportunities to young people so, so they can, you know, feel more competent and prepared and they can fulfill their dreams, etc. But also the skills, the different skills are going to change according to the context and according to time and the needs of the world. And uh, we now, like during the last year, we were in the process inside of ISEC to review our programs and to create new initiatives and programs so we can provide these skills to young people, to our beneficiaries, to our participants, to our program participants, and also to review what kind of competences our members need. Uh, but most important for, for all, like competences can change across the time, but competences are only the reflection of behaviors and behaviors are the reflection of values. And our values are the ones that are permanent and uh, the ones that are going to make people move and look for things. And we have one amazing value that is striving for excellence. And I think we do that well in different ways. And striving for excellence is going to make any young person like member or program beneficiary to first to be open to receive all these skills and also to look uh, for themselves how do we can develop all these things and to improve our organization and also to improve other uh, companies, organization, uh, other partners that we get in contact with. Thank you. Interesting, interesting, definitely. Okay, Arishik, I'm also very interested to hear what uh, you think about it. Thank you so much. Um, so for me, um, definitely it's important that they develop uh, skills through our programs. If so, why? Because right now the debate about employability has become extremely big. People have focused more on skill development than education in some areas. 
But here is where I want to take a step back and understand the difference between, is it the fact that we need to future-proof them or how do you make sure that we give people exactly what they want? Because when you take a perspective of a different entity, for example, I come from India where the startup ecosystem is booming right now. So that means that if I'm recruiting ISACers in India and I'm sending them to different places, I need to be aware of the fact that these are the skills that these young people want to develop in themselves. So for me, the bigger question is how do you assess that? How do you sit down with, with young people and understand what is it that they require? And secondly, how do you take the learning and development uh, that we do in ISEC to give people exactly what they need? Because as much as I want to believe that everybody needs all of it, it's obviously there's going to be a bias in terms of what people want to actually learn more about because every job doesn't need these. Some jobs need more of different things. So for me, the bigger question is how do you allow people to understand what is it that they require and customize it for them through, the, uh, through our programs? Of course, we have an inner journey, outer journey. We have a support system like Luis mentioned. Um, which actually allows you to customize things and learn better. But as an organization, we need to focus more on how do we consciously and deliberately make the choice of teaching them something. And this has to be customized entity by entity. We cannot have a one size fit all solution. Um, and what we need to change is basically identify not just what you want to learn, but also what is your capacity to understand information? Because if I don't understand your capacity as much as you have intentions, maybe I'm giving you too much information. Maybe I'm pushing you to have experiences which are not necessarily suitable for you. So I think that is what I want to look at an individual and make sure that they have the right job in the right place at the right time. And I think that would be my answer. Thank you. Thank you so much. Caroline, after you have heard already so many interesting answers to that question, what are the key things that you believe needs to change? Yeah, um, perfect. I, just very quickly to also respond to the first point, I think it's a no-brainer that yes, we need to, because the second we choose not to develop the skills, we choose not to be relevant. Um, so I think I would like to also echo what, um, or build up on what Virnia was saying um, about, yes, Isaac has the fixed values that it develops and also the skills. However, I would like to add that we shouldn't take for granted that we are already developing these skills because the skills and the competences change. So I think that what we need to do in 2022 is to reevaluate how we are currently building these competences in young people and how we can do better and sit with our partners and also understand um, what is relevant to an employee in 2025 and what is relevant to the world in 2025 so we can be relevant for young people and actually um, help them develop the competences that will lead them to be successful in the future of work. Perfect, thank you so much. So the last one for this question is Nabudia. Yes, um, for the first one, I completely agree with the panel. There's, there, it's a no brain as well, but I want to build upon what Lenny Virnia and Caro was telling is, uh, like we have when, when we have the values which are being developed, but also each product which Isaac creates has its own competencies. So different products has different competencies which we want to develop in the people who take the product. So I think we also need to consider when we are doing innovations, how we can include these future-proof com competencies to the products to make future-proof products. And once we make these kind of future-proof products for ISAC, we would be able to develop these kind of competencies throughout these products. So I think this is where, if you're looking at what ISAC needs to change is how we do innovation. And especially as each product that we have has a competency connected to it, how we include these uh, future-proof elements to it. I think that would be my answer as well. Thank you. Thank you so much. Very interesting, and I think um, it is uh, kind of a real opportunity for all of us to um, support each other in here. Perfect. So next question um, is, I think, also about a very important topic. Um, it's about mental health. And um, as a recent report issued by the United Nations states the following. The world was not set up to respond to the growing mental health crisis before COVID-19. And now it's not how. Mental health conditions contribute to 25% of years lived in disability in the world. There are several reasons why mental health has been ignored. The first one is an associated stigma. The second, is a perception of mental health disorders as a luxury good. 
as opposed to an actual illness. So what do you think is the role of ISAC in addressing this issue amongst young people? And I think it's also a really important topic because it can change a lot and can also drive a lot. And this time, um, the order um, starts with Lenny. So whenever you're ready, feel free to start. Uh, that's a very important topic indeed. And I think for us uh, in Isaac, all of us uh, watching now, participating, uh, probably all of us went through um, some mental well-being struggles here and then, uh, sometimes bigger, sometimes smaller. But um, so I think the first thing we need to think about is and where we actually need to start is our membership, the people who work for Isaac. If we do not take good care of the people who work for us, who put so many endless hours uh, unpaid or very little paid into the organization, the, the highest priority needs to be their mental well-being. Um, that's the minimum we can back and can give back and which we have to give back. Um, and I think there indeed, um, it's a type of culture we also foster within the organization. Um, do we reward someone spending 60, 70 hours in the office or do we reward someone also um, spending half of it but getting the same amount of work done? And I think in Isaac, we get into this uh, vicious cycle of trying to work as much as we can to get as much as out of there. But it's scientifically proven that uh, this is not yielding any better results than really trying to work on yourself, being mentally okay, um, and then attacking the work there and seeing what, what you can get done there. And the second part, I think that it's very important for us also coming out of COVID, uh, COVID accelerated the mental unwell being of so many young people around there um, uh, over those, those last uh, one and a half years that we have to think about how can we be radically inclusive for all of those young people, create the safe place for them. Maybe uh, where they live, where they go to school, whatever they do in their lives, they don't feel safe. They don't feel like who they can actually be or be themselves. Isaac needs to be a place where they can be because we accept everyone to enter. We want to live diversity. We want to empower each other um, and uh, yeah, provide good quality experiences. Um, so I think that we have to do a lot of work on how do we be truly inclusive to a lot more young people who can may maybe also not really afford to be part of Isaac um, because of uh, a lot of other reasons. Um, yeah, so uh, start with our membership and then second focus on how do we become truly inclusive for a lot more young people around the world who cannot afford to be in, in Isaac uh, right now and to provide the same safe environment for them. Great, thank you very much. Perfect, so next in line this time is Virnia. Thank you, you so think? much. Thank you. Well, first I want to start with a, with a story when uh, I was in India, in Middle East and Africa, and we were talking with uh, a young person that, there and, and she was telling me like, I feel I feel that I, I don't want to eat. I am not sleeping. I must be sick. And then I was like, no, like, aren't you depressed? And the answer was, no, I cannot be depressed. That is a white thing. And later with other people also, we were com making conversations that most of the people don't go and look up for help. And, or when they tell their families how they feel, uh, like one of the solution is to go to church, which is not bad, but it's not professional help. So I want to emphasize in the in the part of awareness. So the first thing, like it's not only about ISA, but all all of the people should be aware of this. And as the same way that we treat first aid, that you that you should know how to give you know first aid in in different situations so you can help anyone that you're seeing in problem. We should learn how to recognize when a person is having mental uh, difficulties. And so we can provide uh, advices or take them to the right people. And uh, second is action. So we can know uh, first for ourselves what kind 
how we can take care our, uh, about our mental health and how we can, as I was saying, recognize these signs in other people so we can help them. And uh, we can do that like in, for the people in all our programs, uh, both internal as membership or from uh, in, other ex in other programs that we have. So it resumes to awareness and uh, as action, knowing what to do for ourselves and for our fellow others. Thank you very much. Yes, absolutely. So, Arishek, now the question goes to you and um, let's see what you think about it. Wonderful. Um, I agree with uh, what Vernia and Lenny both said. And I think that the first focus for us needs to be about how do we create a safe environment for our members, firstly, to accept themselves to be okay with the fact that no matter where I am from, no matter who I am, no matter who you are, when I'm in ISIC, I'm an ISICer and I'm okay. So I think that notion of the fact that, hey, whoever you are, I got you, you belong to us, and this is who we are, is very important for me. The power that we hold in our conversations, a simple check-in of like, hey, how are you doing today? But if it comes from a different culture, that is something which is extremely beautiful in ISIC. The fact that we can allow people to connect with one another, but in different parts of the world, because yes, COVID has accelerated this. 48% of Gen Z constantly complain that they are either anxious or stressed all the time. And that's 44% for millennials. This is what just a recent survey says. So if people are so stressed, that means they want something. They want those right conditions. And we also need to recognize, like Vanya said, that we are not professionals in, in, in educating them on all the things. But we can make sure that we are building them a safe space so that they have these conversations. I think the stigma can only be broken if somebody starts talking about it. When your leader starts talking about it, when your leader represents you by saying that this is a conversation we must have, I mean, obviously, you don't want to force anybody to have the conversation, but the fact that, yes, let's open this conversation and talk about the fact that this is an important conversation for people because this is what young people need right now. So to recognize that, I think that will be the first thing which is important. To then educate somebody that this is how you need to identify if you are in a good state or not a good state, and these are the steps that you can take. These are the people that you can talk to. This is the safety net that you have. ISEC should essentially build a safety net, not just for ISECers, but when you impact ISECers, when you are opening the conversations for them, they open conversations with somebody else. They start recognizing these signs in somebody else. So I want you to visualize a safety net around the world where people are okay with the fact that, yes, I, I need to take a leave of absence because I am not necessarily feeling very good. And your leader doesn't question you, but understands you. I think that is where it starts. It starts at an individual level and then you multiply that. And then that is how you know you create an organization safe enough for people from all walks of life to come and belong and feel that this organization gets me. I'm okay. I'm okay. You're okay. We are going to be okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, very interesting to hear so far. And I think it's a very serious topic, definitely. Um, Caroline, what are your thoughts about this? Yeah, I think that I would like to distance um, from Isaac necessarily because I think that that's a topic that affects all young people, right? No matter whether you're in Isaac and, or you're not. And I think that talking about Isaac, I think our role here specifically is to, as my colleagues have said, destigmatize, build awareness, make it a topic. But I think also one thing that is very important is that um, with that awareness, we bring the difference between having a diagnosis and feeling anxious and also bringing these type of things. Because for example, if you have, and we're starting to treat a diagnosis like illness. And I think that's the first part of actually making it, um, how to say, making it real. Because if a person that actually has a broken leg, you're not going to tell them to like run faster, right? If a person um, has severe depression, you're not you shouldn't ask them to go out more. And I think that that's specifically also that. And I think Isaac's role specifically in this year has been starting the conversation, talking more about it. And I think that also it needs here role models that you can be a great leader, not despite the diagnosis, but with your diagnosis. And I think that we've had some great role models of this um, within the organization of this year. So I think our role is to continue to do better and um, to also within the next year continue bringing this awareness more as we have started this year yeah 
Thank you very much. Okay, so we have two candidates left, so it will be interesting. Um, what are your perspectives on that? The next one is um, Navodia. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, I think one of the things, especially when we talk about like uh, breaking the stigma, I think more and more need, people need to talk about this. So we need to, as I said, we need to advocate on this topic itself. And also, I think we need to address specific issues. For example, discrimination. For an example, building an inclusive ISAC, uh, building, uh, having, uh, having anti-harassment policies in the organization. So these kind of specific things actually cause a lot of uh, mental health problems for young people. And I think, as I said, we need to uh, like take action and set an example for it for all the young people. So I think we need to shape our culture as well as our systems uh, where we make it possible. For an example, even in Isaac International, we have a budget allocated for uh, for therapy. So these kind of things, these kind of actions, actually support it, and we need to talk about this and we need to advocate for this. I think also without being very generic, we need to address specific issues uh, of inclusivity, all of this, which makes them, which puts all this, this uh, uh, stress for young people as well. I think that is uh, something that we need to focus on as well. Uh, and yeah, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Luis, now your turn. You're the last one and it will be interesting to see what you have to add. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Yeah, I'll start off by saying I 100% agree with what's already been said by everyone else. Um, I think there's just one thing that I'd like to add on to this as well, is that in terms of the role that ISAC plays, I think when we're talking about the role that ISAC should play, I think the first place that ISAC needs to look at is its membership, um, as so many people have already said before. I think it's about understanding what is also the demographics of our current membership and understanding how stress actually affects a lot of people, in, like especially Generation Z. And I think when we talk about mental health and we're talking about how we can build a safe environment for young people, how we can be more inclusive, how we can recognize the signs, I think we also need to recognize that I say, as us, as young people ourselves, we are not experts in this topic too. So I think the first thing is our sense of responsibility and our due diligence simply as like the employers, so to speak, um, in making sure that we are educating ourselves. We are partnering with organizations that know about the topic. Uh, we are investing our resources in it. We have this as something that we're spending our time into looking into as well. And I think secondly as well is that how we are shaping the working environment for our volunteers and also for like um, our employees too. So what does flexibility look like? Um, do we have mental health days? What is the procedures that we go through and be able to approve this? Is it something that it's no questions asked, which it should, or is it something that, you know, there's a lot of, um, you know, a lot of barriers to be able to receive it as well. And I think also at the same time is not as simple as just us saying, yes, we should have work-life balance. And yes, we understand that young people these days really value work-life balance. Um, but we also need to understand that young people take their responsibilities very seriously as well. So it's not just as simple of like, okay, cool, um, take some time off if you need it, but let's not add to the stress and let's look much deeper into what are the roles and what are the responsibilities, how are we already currently designing the job descriptions that we expect young people to actually do and is it realistic? And if it's not, and if it's too much, then what are the hard conversations we really need to have to be able to reduce it? So it's not just about putting the onus or the responsibility on the member, or on the employee to, you know, figure it out within the hours that you should be working. But I think us, we need to take a bigger role in making sure that the environment that we're building, the organization that we have right now is actually allowing our young people to have a work-life balance and to be able to focus on their own mental health in the process. Awesome, very much. Thank you very much. And I think it's true what all of you said. So it's a serious topic and um, I think it can uh, be quite a game changer as well. Another topic which is quite important and also quite serious um, is actually the climate change that the world currently is facing. From wildfires caused by extremely hot temperatures um, to cities floating due to rising water levels, which we actually just recently had also here in Germany, um, and countries um, expecting very extremes, unexpected weather um, that are affecting soil and infrastructure, is, uh, it is just expected to get worse. And even though the people who will suffer the most are the upcoming generations. So actually you guys and everyone who's following. 
And the responsibility to do something lays on all of us. And NGOs like Isaac included, of course. So what would you say is the role Isaac plays in addressing this issue? And this time it will start with Vunia. Whenever you're ready, please go ahead. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much for the question. And what you just said indeed is, uh, is true. Like there are, there have been a lot of changes around the world right, to, due to climate change. And this is going to keep happening uh, because what the projections have been done is, has been fulfilled. So we have to be ready that natural disasters like this are going to keep happening. So the question is, uh, for our society, if we have the means, the technology and the infrastructure in place to face these challenges and also how we can reduce and take more responsibility on this. So in terms of people, it follows in two things, awareness and action, where uh, ISA can play a role. First, awareness, I think many organizations, etc. I have worked on that. And now we have more awareness in the world about this. And the second step is action, is understanding what we can do in our, uh, you know, in our daily lives and how we can change or improve our lifestyle so we can also help into the reduction of all the contamination, etc. And uh, in that, I can also help uh, first bringing information and clear action steps also through our programs that we have and finally by the development of the values that we do so a person feels really connected and uh, responsible for our world uh, we have values like uh, ensuring sustainability and uh, also spreading the world enjoying participation and all these things so uh, in this part it's not only about what role can we play but it's also what is our responsibility? Like we should take actions towards this. Awesome, thank you very much, Vanya. Avishek, now your turn. What do you think about this very important topic as well? Thank you so much. Uh, I want to recount a very quick uh, tale here. The first time I joined ISEC, somebody asked me where is it that I wanted to go? I said, I really want to go to Maldives because uh, technically, that is supposed to be the first country which is going to be affected by climate change and it would be the first country in the world which would actually probably sink when climate change uh, shows its full effect, right? So that was the first time I've heard about climate change when I came into ISAC. But now answering the question, ISAC has a very unique role because of the fact that young people want to be sustainable. This is a green generation that is coming up right now. I personally have encountered multiple icicles who started using bamboo toothbrushes, who started making small changes in their lifestyle, and they're aware enough of the fact that even small changes will matter. The recent incident in, in the Gulf of Mexico, where you had uh, the sea burning with the fire in the middle, is a distinctive image of like how climate change um, is going to be very real and how if we don't collectively come together as humanity to address that, we are only going to accelerate that particular process. So what do I want to talk about is the fact that we as ISEC, we should be youth advocates, right? We are the global youth voice. We want to be able to go and say that this is the seat at the table that we want to take. This is what we want to talk about. This is what young people talk about. This is what young people care about. And we want to make sure that we are informing the bodies who can actually work on decision-making for this. You have to take sure, make sure that all the programs that we have are, uh, are taking uh, care of the carbon footprint. We should be able to understand exactly how much are our actions impacting the environment and make sure to negate that in the process of our programs itself. When you look at membership, the, type, the way we have conferences, the way we run our offices, all of these things can have small changes. And I keep stressing on small changes because for young people, it's very important for them to understand what is my role. 
I want to know what are the things that I can do which can actually make a change because they want to make a difference. And that is what you need, we need to identify. When you talk about the green world in 2030, which is also based on research, we talk about how companies have also started noticing the fact that their youngest employees want them to take a stand. They want them to be more sustainable. Businesses right now are rising about 33% where they're more sustainable than ever before. So a lot of things that I want to talk about, but the last thing I want to leave us with is the fact that we have a value in ISEC where we talk about sustainability. So this is a value that we need to be very conscious about, which we need to practice. And that is how I think we start the conversation. We spark, we spark the light and that is how we are able to move forward with it. Thank you so much. Thank you very much as well. So Caroline, what do you think? Um, what is kind of ISIC's role in this super important topic of the world? Uh, thank you, Sulka. I think that um, first I would like to say, of course, we cannot forget and undermine individual actions and they are important. They're one of the most important things. But also one thing that we need to understand is that that will no longer be enough, right? We need industry leaders, we need government leaders, we need policymakers to also um, take action towards that. And I think that's where especially Isaac comes in in developing young responsible leaders of being able to have people in these positions in the future that will make that and also advocate um, to people that are currently in these positions, like Abhishek was saying already before. And I think there I relate a lot to that because, for example, um, me growing up, being born and growing up in Austria, the Austrian school system teaches you to think very critically. So I know all of these facts. I know that what are the things that necessarily are wrong with the world. But one thing that our school system does not teach you is how to act on it and how to actually be solution oriented and contribute to solving the problem. So I think that's something that, for example, Isaac showed me as well. Is it gave me the skill to do complex problem, sol problem solving and understand how I can actually be part of making a difference. And I think that's where I see Isaac's biggest role is giving people the skills, the competences um, in order to actually be able to act on the issues that they care about. So Isaac itself will not necessarily directly solve the climate crisis, but Isaac will develop leaders that can contribute actively and effectively to issues that they care about, which is climate change. So that's how I see Isaac's role within that. Thank you very much, Caroline. Awesome. Navodia, what's your insights? What's your perspective on this topic? What do you think? Yes, uh, very interesting topic indeed. I think the here, as we know, we have to, like nine more years to deliver what we promised on the Paris Agreement. And especially today, we know we cannot go to a level of 3%. A three degrees increase of uh, temperature. So something that we are fighting for is with a sense of urgency to make sure that we don't go beyond 1.5 degrees Celsius of increase. So I think this is something that we need to advocate directly about and also communicate this with information. Because if we want people to act with a sense of urgency, we want to give them context. We want to give them information so that people can actually take action. And also one thing generally what we are doing is we want to reduce the impact and we want to work on things that will in the future that will reduce it but also we want to work on things like uh, adaptation for example already things are happening already natural disasters are happening like even the recent uh, case of flooding in europe as well so we need people to act on it we need people to respond to this so i think we also need to develop our uh, develop young leaders to act on these uh, problems that we will anyway going to face and we need to advocate for the governments for corporations to change the system and also be, be make sure that we proactively act on these things so i think these are the two things that we need to act especially for isaac to create uh, and se a sense of urgency uh, by advocating as well uh, yeah over to you Awesome, thank you very much. Luis, what do you think? What uh, do you have to add? Thank you for the question. I would like to start by saying 100% agree with what Carol said, where ISIC's role is developing young leaders, is the indirect impact. And it's not just about climate change, but it's around any issues that we're seeing in the world. Like the whole idea of ISEC is that while you're in this organization, you're able to, you know, go through a challenging environment, you develop practical skills so that when you leave this organization, then you're able to go out into the world and make a positive impact in whichever sphere you choose. And that could probably include climate change, knowing how much young people actually value this. Um, however, another part I also like to emphasize 
is ISEC as an organization itself and how sustainable are its actions in the way that it's running its operations. Um, so prior to the pandemic, uh, we ran a lot of global volunteering internships. So as we all know, the idea of even going on a plane to go to another country, like the carbon footprint is massive on that. And I think when this program first started, say like around 10 plus years ago, um, the whole idea of you know, going overseas to discover yourself, to make an impact, um, was say more attractive, where now young people are more conscious about their environmental impact, the footprints that they're leaving behind. Um, so maybe for this generation, it would no longer seem that attractive for them to be able to contribute this much to climate change, um, just for a purely uh, selfish reason, so to speak. So I think the way that ISEC is also looking at its portfolio and the cooperation that it's running also needs to take into consideration climate change. Um, I think a good step we're going is we're already having like virtual exchange programs. So the idea that young people um, are able to actually experience ISEC, able to develop themselves, uh, why not also like, you know, um, having such a big carbon footprint and big um, influence on the environment. And I think also is that the young people that we have in the organization today are very much aware of climate change and then aware that it's also up to individual actions as well. And they also believe that ISEC has a role to play in this. Um, when I was first like a member in ISEC, and I think back to my very first national conference in 2012, um, it was very wasteful. Like there was balloons for everything. There were streamers, there was flip charts. There was like a lot of materials we ordered and we only used it one time. Um, where I see like now, um, conferences and how they've involved is that when young people speak up like hey I don't want to you know just have a lot of balloons that will just be used once or they're more conscious about where our resources are and if they're actually sustainable I think these sort of little actions as well can also contribute to the role that ISA can also play um, in making sure that young people are aware but they're also taking those daily actions to be able to reduce it. Thank you very much. Last one for this question. Leonard. What's yes. your opinion? Well, I think first of all, it's very important to say that it's probably one of the biggest things humanity ever has to face to uh, fix climate change. And we can simply not afford to fail, simply not afford to not uh, turn it around um, in order to secure our planet and, and make sure that future generations can live from it. Now, another important thing for me to think about is, yes, we have floods in Germany, the Netherlands, Belgium, um, but climate change is present in so many parts of the world for so much more already. There's parts of the world where there's drought every single day and, and people have lost their entire lives already just because of that. But I think the dramatic thing what we can see now is that how fast it, it can also hit other parts of the world. Maybe for, for some time, it, we were really not impacted by it. And I think that shows us how dramatic the situation is by now. Um, and I think what we can do in Isaac, three very concrete things. First of all, if we want to advocate for it, and we need to advocate for it, because if you look at the movement like Fridays for Future, mobilizing a million people all around the world, it shows what young people want to do. And if we want to stay relevant in the future, like we got to offer them something too. And it all starts with Isaacers being change agents, Isaacers advocating for that as well. Um, so we have the backbone for that. The second part is we need to think a lot bigger than the, the daily things, the small things that we can do in our daily lives. Um, I've became vegetarian myself uh, for the facts of climate change, but I'm also tired of taking sacrifices. There's so much money in this world. We just have to be reallocated in order to, to drive some serious um, change. And I think we as Isaac, we can be this change agent, 30,000 young people in our organization, all the people we engage with, like, how can we drive policy? How can we drive um, governments all around the world to be like, hey, there's 30,000 young people here who want you to focus on climate change. Please do so. Like, how can we get there? Um, and the last one is, how can we finally start to co-create values with our partners? Um, because we have a choice. We have a choice to choose who we work with. Um, I know that sometimes we do not because of financial reasons, but let's think further than that. How can we even drive change with them? If, if we need them to have here at our conference to be sustainable, good. But let's not forget that we also have other objectives. Um, how can we maybe drive change through Isaac inside their companies, whether it's through Isaac or through conversations or anything. Um, so Isaac is being change advocates voice of youth, drive real change with our membership, and last but not least, co-create values together with our partners and like-minded organizations. Thank you very much.
And I think just one little thing to add from my side, I think Isaac, with the power of so many young people, really have the power to change something in the world. And um, it's not just about doing things, it's also a lot about mindset change. And I think that's something that you can really drive and which can have a lot of impact in the world, wherever you go, if it's on a voluntary exchange or if you start your internship in a company, you have the power to change the mindset also of our organizations, for example. Awesome, thank you so much. And um, now we have actually two more questions, which were coming from the audience directly. So um, the first question that was asked by Ali from Isaac in the Philippines is the following. With the refreshed Isaac way, we have updated our definition from being non-political to non-partition. How do you reconcile the change with Isaac being more direct and vocal about social issues like those in relation to governmental leaders? And we will just continue with the same uh, round of uh, participants asking. So now it would be Abhishek to start and then Caroline, Navudia, Louise. Leonard and Vilnia. I hope that the question will also be displayed to you guys so that you have the chance also to read it again. And whenever you're ready, same procedure, just start. And thank you very much, Ali, for uh, asking this question. Right. Thank you so much, Ali, for asking that question. Um, one, of the, one of the overwhelming trends which you observe time and again. Okay, I think Omar posted the question. Thank you, Omar. Perfect. Thank you. So, uh, one of the overwhelming trends that we have um, for young people right now is the fact that they want their organizations to take a stand. This is a trend that we see repeated over and over again because we live in a generation where young people associate activism uh, very strongly. It's one of the values that they have is the fact that you should be able to stand up for what is right. Now, of course, the definition of what is right and what is wrong is very contextual. It depends on the diversity. When you look at the enormous diversity of the organization, of course, this, uh, this, can, have, this can be different from person to person. But at the end of the day, the things that guide us, which is the Isaac way, also talk about the fact that you have certain values that you want to live by. You have a code of uh, ethics that you want to live by. You have certain things that you believe are important as an organization. And one of that, in that same Isaac way, it talks about the fact that when you talk about being political, now we don't want to talk about being political anymore because we want to say that we want to be able to stand up for people who are not necessarily um, getting the support that they require people who are oppressed, people who are suffering, and people who are essentially not being treated as human beings. This is a bigger question. This is a question of humanity. And of course, as I said, if, if we started after the Second World War, where you said that humanity as a collective is suffering right now, and that is why Isaac came into existence, then I am surprised as to why we cannot continue to do that, because we are standing here for the bigger picture. I don't think we will politically or we will align with an ideology as such as much as we want to align with humanity. We want to stand up for human rights. We want to stand up for people who need us because if we don't, if you don't, I don't know what we are doing here. I don't know what else is leadership about, except the fact that you want to stand up for people who, who need you. So I think that is the response from my side. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. So, Caroline, what are your thoughts about this interesting question from your delegates? Mm -hmm, perfect. Thank you, Ali, for asking that. And I think that um, I would like to refer to the quote of not taking a stand is also taking a stand. And I think that making the move from being non-political to non-partisan is giving us the opportunity to take a stand on topics Isaac already cares about. 
However, also like Silke was mentioning two minutes ago, was that Isaac really can move people because we are able to reach a lot of people. So I think that with this change, also we need to understand our responsibility on what are the topics we do take a stand about and understand our reach that we are having. So through that, I think that we can take human rights as a very good moral compass of understanding on how Isaac can be nonpartisan and also not necessarily in favor to a specific party. So I think that's very important that we continue to safeguard that in order to not have the opposite effect of becoming exclusive rather than more inclusive. But I see that as a great opportunity for Isaac to really take a stand and to also connect to Gen Z, to our generation, um, to also be able to take a stand because talking about issues that matter to, to us is also representing Isaac values of demonstrating integrity. So I think that's a very important step that we're currently taking. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Okay. Next person would be Nabulia from this yes. audience. What do you think? Uh, yeah. Uh, thank you, Ali, for the question. I think I'll just build upon what Carl was mentioning as well. Uh, because I think previously when, when with the Isaac, we had a non-political. Um, what happened was most of the time, most of the issues that we are talking about, for example, uh, fundamental human rights, are being politicized and it makes it makes us not being able to talk about it. So what happens is we are we are missing out a lot of things that we fundamentally should talk about, should advocate about, should speak up. We 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 had, had did not have the opportunity or we were not really clear about whether we can do it or not as well. I think with this clarity of moving from non-political to non-partisan, now we understand exactly uh, what are things and also. In, in the Isaac way now, we also have that we stand up and speak up for the fundamental human rights. I think this is a huge step and a huge um, uh, a way forward for Isaac to become a more relevant and inclusive uh, youth organization. I think, uh, yeah, so this is how, how we can progress further and how we will improve our effects, uh, uh, efforts on advocacy as well. Uh, yeah, over to you. Thank you very much. Very interesting to hear these kind of thoughts from you guys. And um, so next one would be Louise. What's your opinion? Thank you, Ali, for the question. Um, I agree. Uh, just to echo off from what like Navodia and what Carol were already saying as well, is that I think this shift is definitely for sure an opportunity. I think um, during my time in ISEC, whenever there was like something that was happening in the world or when there was an issue that young people cared about. Um, I remember there were always members being like, oh, should Isaac make a post about this? Should Isaac say something about this? Um, Isaac not saying anything about it also doesn't look good on us as well, considering we're working you know, towards peace and fulfillment. So I think this change is definitely a step in the right direction. And in terms of moving forward, I feel like it's still about a lot of, like we still need a lot of education in terms of exactly what does it mean and where are the lines and still what are the things that we still can and cannot do. Um, the network and also AI as well. I don't think it's just as simple as like, cool, we changed like two words around now, let's go ahead. Um, so I think that's one thing just to make clear. And I think secondly as well, like when young people or when the world is looking at ISEC and they're seeing us like, you know, practicing what we preach, it goes beyond just what are the things that we are posting on social media to show that we care about certain issues or that we're taking a stand on fundamental human rights. I think beyond what our words are actually telling us, it's also important um, about what our actions are also reflecting as well. Like what is the work that an ISEC in ISEC is currently doing and how does this help move the world forward in a certain way? And not just people that are in the organization, but also our alumni. Like that's what ISEC is saying, like that's where the magic happens, that's the impact. So for us, it's not also about, you know, what we post and what we say, but how can we also showcase more um, our alumni, people that are actually making a positive impact in community because actions always speak louder than words. Perfect, thank you very much. So then we just have two more candidates and then actually also this panel comes to an end. So. Leonard and Vilnia, it's now also your chance to answer this question and um, share your thoughts with uh, all your delegates. Yes, I was actually very excited when I read about this change for the first time and when I started to think about a bit, um, what does that mean for Isaac? Um, and I think if, well, if we think about where we come from, uh, why Isaac was founded right after the Second World War with a very simple purpose to just avoid war and get to know other people. 
And if we now think about the entire Isaac way and, and our purpose as an organization, I think it is absolutely essential that we stand up for basic human rights and that we advocate for this and that we educate our membership and all the people we engage with, with Isaac, that we actively edu educate them about everything that's happening there. Because for me, it, it is a no-brainer that this is connected to achieving peace and fulfillment of humankind's potential uh, eventually one day. And I think for a long time, we just limited ourselves by it. And when we are too focused on um, internal discussions, internal processes, optimizing everything we do, and we forgot a bit to think about the impact we can actually drive. Silke, you mentioned it, the impact we can have all around the world. And I think they're like basic human rights, standing up for what's right and, and driving that change as well is essential for that. So I'm very, very excited that we can finally start doing this without always having to have this conversation with, oh, but is that now political or is that not political? Can we do this? Can we not do this? But I also indeed want to echo what uh, Luis said, that there's a very fine line. We, all of us are young people. All of us are just getting into this and maybe also experience for the first time uh, politics and standing up for human rights, all of this. Um, so we do need to be very careful that um, it's inclusive, right? That there's a foundation we agree on, and this is what we want to drive. All of us are still going to disagree on many other topics, but we got to have this foundation, right? Um, and I think then we can, we can be vow very powerful and also be loud towards the external world, towards the outside, like-minded organization, co-creating value, without being afraid that we have our PR person uh, uh, talking to us that we are too political and maybe uh, do something wrong. Um, so yeah, super excited uh, for this and I hope it will, be, uh, will turn out well for Isaac. Thank you very much, Leonard. So, Wilmia, it's actually your final words for this round. So please go ahead. We're interesting to hear your opinion as well. Thank you so much. I am actually very happy listening to my fellow candidates. Uh, I think like nonpartisan means exactly that, that we are not taking sides. Uh, because one thing are human rights or the cause, and other thing is the people that talks about it. So we are not taking sides on the people that talks about it, but we are talking about the, the human rights per se. And uh, as all my fellow uh, mates have mentioned, that's why uh, ISEC was created because of the humankind. And I also, I just want to add one more thing that actually we're very privileged. We're very privileged because we have this platform where we can talk about these kind of topics and we can raise up our voice, not only inside ISEC, but outside and that partners, companies, organizations, the world can listen to us. And uh, this privilege comes with a responsibility. So I think it's our responsibility to be loud and talk about this. It's our responsibility to talk for the people that is not as privileged as us. And that is what leadership is about, is taking that responsibility that comes with certain privilege. And that's what ISF does. Thank you very much. And also thank you very much uh, to all of you um, for sharing your thoughts, your insights, your opinions, your visions with all the people online. And I hope that also um, these questions and the panel hopefully, hopefully really helped everyone to make your decision on uh, you guys. Um, it was very interesting also for me to hear um, all your different thoughts. And um, I can just uh, say from my side, I wish all of you good luck. Um, I think um, it was amazing um, to talk to you, to have your um, opinions. And um, I can only say, always try to be true to yourself and um, be yourselves. And I think that's the best thing that you can do and um, show what you really stand for and what you like, what you want to change. And then you will be fine. And um, now I would like to close this panel. Thanks a lot and hand back to Lorena. And um, good luck from our side again. We will see each other for sure <laughs> later on. Bye.
Okay, amazing. Um, I think that just to wrap up, um, we still have one last question from the audience to give all the um, people the opportunity to answer first. So I will just read it. I apologize for the small um, for the small labs. Um, let me just check here, which is the question. Yes. And the last question um, that comes from Tiny in the Netherlands is, what do you see as the role of ISEC in taking global issues such as climate change, racism, social inequality? So what is the role of ISEC in all of this? Um, and we would start with Cairo first. I think I can start, right? Okay, perfect. Uh, thank you very much. One second, sorry. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much, Tane, also for this question. I think that um, here I would like to appeal to the last question or other questions that we've answered. I think that Isaac Rowe specifically is there for standing up for these topics in terms of awareness and then in order to build the skills in young people in order um, to also contribute to solutions towards these issues. Thank you. Okay. Um, yeah, from my side, uh, uh, while I uh, echoing what Kara has said as well, I think we need to focus on direct and indirect impact that what we are doing as well. So in terms of uh, developing leaders who are aware about these issues and who are built with values who can address these issues is one thing that we can focus on also in the other end, because right now in the world, we need to act with a sense of urgency. We need to focus on things like advocacy. And especially, I think uh, we talked a lot about this panel is about awareness as well as education. I think these are the two things we need to focus on so that actually we can uh, give a direct impact, uh, immediate action as well as uh, for these special issues and address through ISAC as well. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you so much, Navodia. Um, and now we would go to Luis. Thank you. Just a, I 100% agree with what Karen and I have already mentioned. And I think the biggest role that ISEC can play in this is actually to do what ISEC says that is meant to be doing, which is developing youth leaders. Um, I think if we understand, like, the role that we actually have to play is not about direct impact, but it's about indirect impact, but also understanding the responsibility that actually comes with us saying that, yes, this is what we are going to do. This is our contribution to the world and really own it and take it seriously. Because in the moment, sometimes it may seem like, um, you know, we're a bit overwhelmed. We also have like other things that are happening as well. And sometimes we get too caught up in the day-to-day -day work that we're doing, that sometimes we lose sight of the bigger picture. So I feel like moments like these panels like this, where we're having these sort of conversations, actually brings me back and allows us to actually reflect that, yes, like in the day-to-day, -day, things may not always be easy. And there may be other smaller or like um, equally important problems that we're working on. However, at the end, to understand the end objective of ISEC is we want to develop leadership. And we want to do it so that young people can go out there in the world and really make an impact on the things that they really care about. Amazing. Thank you so much, Louise. Um, very uh, good also sharing. And now we go to Leonard. What do you think about it? I actually think I already gave the answer to that uh, in one of the previous questions. So I'm going to... I'm gonna, uh, reflect upon this a bit i think it's three things first of all if we want to advocate for change if we want to combat racism um, save the climate um, reduce inequalities all around the world our members need to be change agent we need to look within um, we need to have an organizational culture that is so strongly shaped by our values and that is not a culture where our values are just on the wall and we like to mention them to our customers and to the people we get into Isaac, but actually values we live by. This needs to be enforced from the very top until the very bottom of the organization. Um, and it needs to start um, at the top to lead by example. The second one is, um, how can we be the voice of youth? Let's stop looking um, only, only worrying about the things with, within Isaac, but also at least spent a little bit of time to go out there again, um, talk to like-minded organizations and see how can we co-create value 
um, why do we not sit together with Fridays for Future and ask them, hey, can we learn from you? Like, how did you mobilize a million young people all around the world to go to the streets and demonstrate every single Friday um, during a week and skip school for that? Let's learn from them so we can, we can amplify our impact. Um, and then I think we need to think bigger. Silke said it, 30,000 young people, we can drive actual change. But we need to funnel all of this together. We need to find the way how can in our countries, in our regions, pick the most important things that are relevant for those regions or your country um, or, or territory, and then um, see how we can drive change through all our young people and um, finally use the power that we have for so many years, but that we are not really utilizing because I think we spend too much time um, thinking and optimizing everything to 100% within Isaac. Um, so I think it's good for us to, to start to go outside a bit more. Amazing. Thank you so much for your sharing. And uh, now we would to Virnia. Thank you, Lorena. I want to start saying that the thing that each one of us, we have different inclinations and the thing that hurts you the most, that is the thing that you are called to change for. And the role of ISEC is providing leaders to the world, leaders with values and purpose. So by, by all this experience, we can find what is our purpose, what is the thing that we want to change in the world. And that's what ISEC is going to help you and also developing values. And values are going to help us to take the right decisions when we are going to be responsible of different things. Uh, and then we can, so we can make this a better place, no? And, if, and each one of us is going to try to solve different things. But the role of ISEC we have to remember is contributing to the world with leaders that have values and purpose. Amazing, thank you so much. And now we have Abhishek. Thank you, Laurena. So um, the question asks about climate change, you already spoke about. You talk about social inequality, you talk about racism, you talk about a lot of divide in the world. Divides start narrowing down when people start talking to each other. And that is what ISEC is great at, is being able to put two people together, probably have different views to understand why they have different views and how and what shapes them. I want to talk about something different. I want to talk about the fact that young people right now have a lot more empathy. They have a lot more emotional intelligence. For us, we need to shape that into a conversation which can allow people to understand how to tackle these things together. Yes, value-based leadership, absolutely. The fact that we are able to create leaders who are going to go out there and change the world. But the conversations need to start here because they can make the conversation happen. On the 15th of August, 2015, I met somebody from Pakistan for the very first time in my life. And that for, moment for me was life-changing, not because of how different we are, but because of how similar we are. When I talk about Pakistan in India, I do have real dangers of people probably admonishing me or maybe screaming at me or refusing to uh, even uh, open that particular conversation. But for me to know that somebody from a different side of the world thinks about the issue in the exact same way, he has the empathy to understand what I'm thinking about, and we are open enough to sit down in a setting to have a conversation about that, I think that is where we start solving issues with the world. I think that is a story I would like to conclude with. Thank you so much for that question, Lau. Amazing. Thank you so much for answering this last minute question. Um, it was amazing to be here with you. I really want to thank our host of this panel, Silke Hein, um, the DPDHL Upgrade Program uh, Partnership Manager, and also um, thank you so much for all of you that have been here um, answering these questions. I think that all of the audience really enjoyed it. I hope you enjoyed this process too. And yeah, now we finish the day um, for today. Tomorrow we'll go into regional Q&As that again, is for MCPs. MCPs will receive all the information. And um, yeah, that is it. Thank you so much. We wrap up day one. Um, if you are in the audience, if you saw this entire day, share your love on social media and also make sure you go through all of the content of today and the applications and sync in all of the things that happened today, the amazing sharings that we had, the amazing speeches that we had. And we will see you back tomorrow. Um, yeah, thank you so much. See you.